tēnā tātou katoa, uh, he mehe nui ki a koutou katoa, ka tai e koutou te whakarongo mai ki au. Is, can, can you hear me, at particularly our guests, because, the, um, because Zoom doesn't appear to be registering my screen. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Okay, wonderful. Okay, well, kanui te mihi ki a koutou katoa. Thank you very much for coming today to participate in this webinar, The River Runs Through. Um, before we begin, me kare kia tātou. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, kia mākina kina ki uta, kia mā taratara ki tai, e hi ake ana te atākura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, tihei, mauri ora. Kia ora, everyone. My name is Alexandra Keeble. I'm part of the engagement team of the Deep South Challenge, Changing with Our Climate. I'm zooming in today from Pariarua, uh, Tatakite Upoko o Te Ika. He tangata tiritia hau. I grew up on Wurundjeri country and I moved to Aotearoa nearly 15 years ago. I'm super thrilled to be part of today's event with our very special guests, Ricky Ellison, Todd Redpart and Jennifer Purdy. This webinar uh, is likely to traverse a lot of ground in the way of a river. Both Jen and Todd are current Deep South Challenge researchers with a significant focus on the rivers of Te Waipounamu. But in our webinars, as in everything we do in the challenge, we try to ensure that conversations about our natural resources and particularly about the use of our natural resources begin with and build on the ideas, knowledges, wisdom and lived experience of mana whenua. So we're also hugely lucky that Ngaitahu expert Ricky Ellison has agreed to join us today to bring a more holistic perspective to questions around the health, current and future flows and uses of this precious tonga. Um, before we really begin and get started, I would, I'd like to, in, and I introduce our guests, I'll just do a little bit of housekeeping in the way that we run Zoom. Um, so each of our guests will speak for around 10 minutes, which should leave us around 25 minutes for questions at the end. And we're asking that you all hold your questions until all presenters have spoken. But to ask a question, you can find the Q&A, the question and answer um, function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It's called Q&A and has a little speech bubble. Um, and we're asking that you type your questions into the Q&A panel rather than in the webinar chat function, which is, tends to sit on the side of your screen. Um, and that when you ask a question, you, you also um, make sure you include the name of the person that you're directing your question to. Um, please keep your questions short and sweet, otherwise they might not be posed. Uh, and please, if you notice that someone has um, posed a question in the chat panel, can you support each other to um, direct each other to the Q&A function so that we don't miss any important questions? Um, one last housekeeping issue is that I am trialling today um, a new internet connection, thanks to Elon Musk via Starlink, um, and hoping that it doesn't drop in or drop out um, at an unopportune moment. So we also have Zoe Hine, our um, Partnerships Director from the Deep South Challenge, uh, here on hand just in case um, something goes awry. We also have a packed Zoom room today, around 300 registrations, and we welcome each and every one of you. Thank you very much for taking time out of your work and lives to listen to and learn from these speakers and so that we can listen and learn from each of you as well. As always, we'll be making our video a video of this seminar available on our YouTube. Um, so please sign up to our newsletter on the homepage of our website to make sure you don't miss out. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Ricky Ellison. Ricky is an advisor to the Freshwater Iwi Leaders Group and a member of the Ministerial Advisory Group, Kahui Wai Māori. Ricky has an in-depth knowledge of te mana o te wai, and in his kōrero, he'll speak to te mana o te wai, what it is, what it means in practice for how we manage why into the future. So, Ricky, over to you. Tēnā koe, Alex, or tēnā tātou. Uh, ko Ricky Ellison, tōku inoa. Ka uri ahau o Ngāti Tūranga Tira, tia tia o mi ngai tahu hoki. Um, thanks, Alex, and kia ora tātou. Uh, been asked to speak a little bit about te mana o te wai um, and been, Alex said, quite deeply involved in the development of this as a concept, well, 
the more recent development of this as a contact in the in the freshwater uh, space. Um, so just a little bit of fuck fuck about Tuana Tawa and its current format, I guess. Uh, it started. Uh, oh, let me share my screen. Um, It started as part of this model, which we developed in 2012. National EV Chairs, a national um, EV freshwater forum in Hopu Hopu. Um, the intention of this model, Namata Purongki to Wai, was to articulate EV aspirations for uh, recognizing their rights and interests across the freshwater regime, um, which is underpinned by those principles on the bottom. Mano Te Wai, Te Te Wai Tangi Te Tahu, Hu o Te Wai. Um, now, working from, from left to right, governance, Iwi have always articulated a desire to be involved in the decision making around water. Limits need to be set as part of the decision making process. We don't have particularly great limits uh, currently, which has allowed the current degradation of our waterways to a large degree. Um, so, the need to set robust and enforce those limits. Allocation that we've expected or have an aspiration to uh, share in the allocable quantum as part of our rights and interests in the transition from where we are now into a new system. So that was largely a model we designed to articulate to the Crown mainly. Um, this is our aspirations from EWI across the board uh, for recognising our right, our extent, our existing rights and interests in fresh water. Um, and Tamano Te Wai was one of those core principles. Uh, and that, that sort of morphed into, I guess, this model, which was more recently developed by Kahui Wai Māori, uh, an advisory group that Minister David Parker set up in 2018-ish, uh, to provide advice to him on, on freshwater management from an iwi perspective. Well, from a Māori perspective, it wasn't an iwi uh, mandated or uh, established group, it was a ministerial government group. Um, which provided advice directly to Minister Parker. Let's go back a little bit. So it's, to my knowledge, why is a is a concept that's deeply rooted in Te Ao Māori, but it's applicable to everybody. It's not exclusive to Māori. I guess is the, is the key message with that. And in Te Ao Māori, everything has Modi and it has a whakapapa. So it has a life force, and, and from that whakapapa from Rangi and Nui, Rangi Nui and Papa Tuanuki. It has a modi, and, and from having modi, it has mana. So to mana to why is the health and well-being of the water bodies themselves. Um, as I said, everything is connected by whakapapa, and our responsibility, our, our obligation as people, as kaitiaki, is to manage how we interact with those with those resources to ensure their sustainability and to, to ensure their ability to support not just us, but our children and, and our children after us. So when I tell you we have a whakatoki that says, mōtato a moka uri a muriaki nei, so mōtato for us, mōkauri a muriaki nei for our children who come after us. That's really the, the crux of the Te Manu Te concept is that the first and foremost thing we need to look after is the water body. And that's flipping what I think the way we've managed water largely in New Zealand to date on its head. Because we've, 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 in my experience, we've approached not just water management, but freshwater management and resource management generally of with an exploitative attitude towards it, how much can we take, how much can we use these things, and then we'll worry about the environmental, the, the sustainability thing secondly. That wasn't the way the RMA was established, but that's the way I think the RMA has, has been uh, managed or enacted. The way we've managed resources over the, over the time has been how much of this thing can we utilise, how much can we use to benefit largely commercial or economic um, Aspect and then the environmental stuff is what's left over after that. If one or two wide turns that around and says the first thing you have to do is to protect the health and well being of the water body. And after that, if you take the, the criteria, the, the hierarchy and the obligation, the second layer there, the second priority is human health needs such as drinking water. And after you're provided for those two things, then you can have a conversation as a community around one of the other values that we have in this water body that we may want to use that resource for. And I said to me that's a completely that's a complete shift from where we've been in the last you know, 30, even 100, 200 years, the way we, we've we approached resources because we've I think we've always assumed it was 
always going to be putting your water around. Lots of places they had been. And the first and first served approach had been driven by, uh, you know, putting an application and we'll assess your application on its merits and then we'll allocate water without so much without thinking so much about the holistic the holistic nature of the water system that it rains in the mountains it flows to the coast it turns in the you know it goes from Waimari to Waitaia and from fresh water to salt water and then back around the circle again we need to understand the holistic concept of actually able to manage this thing sustainably and I think Tamano Tawai is trying to put that front and center so we've developed that previous slide, Namatapono in 2011, 2012, 2014, it was included in the National Policy Statement of Freshwater Management as a preamble, didn't really have any effect, uh, wasn't, didn't have legal standing effectively as a preamble. 2017, that was improved, I guess, to consider and recognise as objective AA1, so it became a, a, it gave it some status and had to do things, but again, I don't think too much changed in the actual way we we thought about water the way we applied to Manal Tiwai in a practical sense. Fast forward to 2020, NPS National Policy Statement Freshwater Management 2020, uh, to Manal must be given effect to. And that's been, a, in, in my experience, a complete shift in the way the community and councils and users of water ha are having a conversation now about to Manal what does that mean for us and how do, what do we have to do to give effect to Manal Tiwai? It's no longer a tick the box exercise. That this is you're starting to see things change. You're starting to see Tamanol Tuwai becoming centre for the development of, of, of new the new national you know regional plans, regional policy statements, and that'll flow through into if the Natural and Built Environment and Sustainable Planning Act, Spatial Planning Act passed. Then Kia ora the Tuwai and Tamanol Tuwai will carry forward into that space as well. So I think for me it's been a a significant change and not just their attitude to water but the way we think about it and the way we look to plan for the use of our resources and not just water because water is the receiving environment everything that happens around it so land use um from the Q to key time and Tamanol to why is not just about Tamanol to why if you think look at the, the wider things that wrapped around that Mahinga Kai is now a compulsory value in the national objectives framework Key to key tie as a, as a criteria that you need to thinking about these things as a system, not just your point in the system, not just your point on the river, but the entire river system, the entire water system from the centre to the coast. So key to key tie um, is a Naito concept that because of where we were located, we were looking to the inland, to Kieta, to the centre, and also looking to the coast. So key to key tie looking from the, from the inland to the centre, all of those things being connected and the need to manage that as a holistic whole, rather than thinking about, oh, my consent is for this, you know, my farm or my factory or my water take um, being in this place, that has an impact on that place, but it also has an impact on the entire system, including the discharge and not just the take of the discharges as well. And that's what we need to be thinking about as a systematic, as the systems-based approach. And the principles across the middle of, of, of that Tamanon on Tawai diagram, Manafaka Heidi. Manafaka Haere is the aspiration or the, or the, the right of iwi and hapu and tangata whenua to be involved in decision making around water bodies that are in their rohi. Within our takiwa, within Naito's takiwa, Naito who wants to be involved in decision making around those water bodies. Kaitiaki Tanga is guardianship, but it's also much more than that. In my thinking, it's about the, the need to ensure these resources can support both us and, and, and future generations. So it's not about just locking it away for the future, it's about using it today in a way that supports us as people today and for future generations as well. It's not one or the other or just the future generation, it's about current use and future use. Manaki Tanga is about our obligation to support all people within our rohi. So support everybody and, and being able to share that resource to ensure that every, you know, our, our whole community is thriving. And Tamanol Tawai is applicable to everybody. It's not just a Māori concept for Māori, for Tangata Whenua, for Māori. It's for everybody to engage in. Because I think the conversations we've had and, and constantly having these on a daily basis with, with others is they sit there, they can see themselves reflected in Tamanol Tawai. If you think about the health and well-being of a water body, I have yet to come across somebody who doesn't think that's important or doesn't think that should be provided for. And Tamanol Tawai gives them something to hang that, that, hang that conversation off the 
to be able to value or see their values being represented in these conversations and not just, as I said, not just for Māori, but for the entire community. So that's where you get to the leadership one on the bottom. So the, if you take the purple, the purple boxes, the, the uh, uh, Te Ao Māori side and, and the green boxes are, are uh, uh, a Tauiwi side, if you like, or, or, or not just the Pākehā side, but a, a wider community, but these mirror each other, right? So Manawhakahauri, Kaitiakitanga, Manakitanga are reflected in governance, stewardship and care and respect. We all have the same obligations, we just describe them differently. Our starting point may be different about how we think about water and how we describe it, but the, the outcome we're all seeking is the same. Te Mano Te Wai is, is healthy water bodies. And I, as I said, I get to see someone who hasn't, doesn't agree with that concept. Um, and on the, that lower bottom layer there, Iwi Hapu Māori Lendon is Fano and Hapori. As Iwi Tangata Whenua, we have obligations and we have responsibilities as Kaitiaki to look after our waterways and ensure they can support us and for, for the future generations. And likewise, the Crown and, and communities also have a significant role to play. We're all in this together. We're not, it's not, this is not just about Māori taking steps to protect our waterways. Everybody has to. Um, and I think that's, you know, we're seeing that more and more in the conversations we're having around planning and spatial planning and restoration of water bodies. You know, we, we see on a daily basis almost reports about degraded water bodies and that things are not where we want them to be. We all know that and that's, and it's important to have that information. We've also got to think about the future and where do we go and I think that that's where Todd and in general, come in is a little bit more about that information. Making better decisions requires better information. So we can talk about Te Manawa Tawai, we can talk about allocation, as I said, limits are critical. Mm -hmm. Setting limits for water flow and, and takes and water quality are critical to delivering on giving effect to Te Manawa Tawai. The Te Manawa Tawai exists on a continuum. It's not just a, a, a point in the river or a, a, a limit is not going to give effect to Manawa Tawai. What we have to do as a community is determine what are the things that are important to us in this, in this water body. What are, how are those things represented, whether that's Mahinga Kai or it's swimming or it's um, other values, other uses we may have on that water body. The, the measure of the Modi and the mana is how well that water body can sustain and support those things, whether that's electricity generation or um, even a irrigation or you know, all the things we use water for make up the mana of that water body. And we need to understand those things and then be able to. It's, it's, it's being able to account for them. And Te Manawa Tewai requires us to account for those things to determine where on that spectrum of Te Manawa Tewai is really degraded or Te, te Manawa Tewai is, you know, is really good. The ultimate being, I guess, if, if, if we don't interact with the river body, that is, that is the, the entire natural state of that water body would be the greatest state of Te Manawa Tewai, if you like. But we're along that continuum somewhere. And as a community, we've got to figure out for ourselves where do we, want, where do we think we, we should be? We're probably... You know, in most places, towards the lesser end of giving effect to Tamanawa Tawai, and we, we're probably below where we think we want to be, but we can restore that. So Tamana, mana is not is not static; it's not locked in place. If something's degraded, we can fix it by doing things that restore the health and well-being of that water body, which will increase the mana and modi of that water body. So those th those are the things for me that are really important. Um, the holistic approach. The setting limits to actually protect these things, the understanding of our water bodies, and I think the stuff that Todd and Jenny are going to talk about are really critical because we don't have great knowledge about, you know, we don't we, we don't know when it's going to rain, we don't know how much it's going to rain, and we don't know where. And I think, you know, the more we can understand those things and this, you know, Todd stuff around snow or, or Jen stuff around electrical generation, electricity generation, and those things are really critical. To understand how much pressure is on both on our waterways, but also as a community, how do we decide what are our priorities? So we need to make some future management decisions and being able to determine as a community that, that these things are important to us will help us make those better decisions. It's not, you know, not taking a you know, this is the order that consent applications were made, therefore we 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 assess them in that order. It's a, it's a deciding what are the priority uses for those resources. What are the things we want to protect? How much do we need? How much water do we need to be flowing at what time of the year? You know, we need freshes, we need floods. 
to maintain the habitat that for mahinga kai, for example. We need to maintain them, protect those things as much as we do other values as well. So alongside that, so it's a balance. Um, and that's what I think Tamanon Tawai pushes us towards. And as I said, to me, that this is, this is a, a huge step change in the way we manage our resources, not just water, because water receives all the, as I said, the stuff from the land ends up in water and impacts our, our mahinga kai and other values. Um, so that's really a completely different mindset that we've had previously. And I think a really exciting time and a huge opportunity for communities, water users, councils, government to reassess and redesign the way we do things. And I think we're seeing more of that now. This conversation is starting to happen at a regional level. It's stuff been happening in communities. It's happening with uh, user groups. It's happening with irrigators. It's happening with farmers. It's happening with um, municipals around how we use water and where we, where we use it and how we do much things much better. And I'm, I'm really excited about that. So that's probably enough for me, Alex. Kia ora, Ricky. Oh, I mean, thank you very much for your very um, clear and also very um, deep presentation on Te Mana o Te Wai. I think um, it deserves a, a full day of, of presentation, but I think it's a really important foundation for the, for the conversation that we're having today. I also look forward perhaps to some conversation at the end of the webinar um, around how Te Mano Te Wai might influence the way we do research um, into the um, health and future of our rivers as well. Um, but to keep ourselves moving along, um, I would like to welcome Todd Redpath. Todd is a snowboarder from Perth, I think, uh, and is a founding member of the Mountain Research Centre at the University of Otago. He's also a board member for Protect Our Winters Aotearoa which gives you a sense of his personal uh, relationship to his to the, the, the subject of his research. Um, his Deep South Challenge research aims to improve the representation of seasonal snow within the New Zealand water model, which um, in my understanding is, is the kind of founding water model that um, hydrologists and then councils, et cetera, use to understand river flow. So over to you, Todd. Kia ora everyone, and nā mahi nui to Ricky for setting the scene there. Um, I'll just quickly do a bit of a change on the screen sharing and make sure we're all good to go there. You might need to unshare your screen, Ricky. Oh, Thank you. Kia Does that work there? Hopefully. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So, yeah, as Alex mentioned, um, I'm currently focused on research looking at really trying to better quantify and characterize uh, seasonal snow in the in the southern alps so in the new mountains of the south island of new zealand and this work is happening uh, within the context of a um, deep south um, science challenge funded project um, that we have the name getting the right answers for the right reasons so trying to better understand what is happening in our alpine catchments in particular and make sure that the snow processes that are occurring in those catchments are well represented and that is influencing uh, the runoff generation that we see in those catchments. So it's a big, a big team effort. And the work that I'm going to be talking about today um, is really focused on the mapping side of things. So mapping and measuring snow from satellite imagery that we're leading out of the University of Otago and the schools of surveying and geography. So working closely with Pascal Sergei, um, Nicholas Cullen and Aubrey Miller, and also John O'Conway at NIWA. Um, and Within the project as well, we've got Brian Anderson and uh, Lauren Vargo at Victoria University in Wellington who are working on some avalanche modeling within this. So it'll be a fairly high level kind of tour of some of the things we've been doing. I'll try and keep it reasonably lightweight and not, not too technical. Um, we'll see how we, how we get on. But to sort of set the scene uh, for what we're thinking about and why, we, why we're doing this work, the motivation here is really to try and better link um, snowfall, so the snow that accumulates in the mountains through the winter and then melts in the spring and, and summer and generates runoff or stream flow effectively, water flowing through our rivers and into our, our lakes and freshwater systems. And the, a key question here really is, that sort of motivates this is, do we have a good handle on the future of snow? Um, and if we want to understand the future of snow in New Zealand, uh, we need to make sure it's well represented in the hydrological models that might allow us to, to project that future. And so we're wanting to make sure that snow processes um, are well represented in the New Zealand water model and more specifically within TopNet where 
where the snow module um, plays a role. So in recent years, there's been some work to improve how ablation or snow melt is modeled, um, but there are still questions around how well we're capturing snow accumulation. And one of the key things that I think about a lot, and we can see in the photo here, we've got, uh, we're up in the, the central Southern Alps, not too far from Mauraki, Mount Cook. We had some fresh snow and we've got these avalanches, so hopefully you can see that are shifting a reasonable amount of snow from relatively high elevations down to lower elevations in the catchment. And as that distribution or spatial pattern of snow changes, that means that the snow is effectively melting in a different location to where it originally fell or accumulated. And so we want to make sure these sorts of things are, are well understood so we can model them. And so the work that we're doing, um, it's really driven by remote sensing or the use of satellite imagery. And there's a, a really strong case for using satellite imagery for looking at seasonal snow in Aotearoa. So we're looking at a wee perspective view of the South Island here, and I've sort of added a, a simulated snow cover to the Southern Alps. And we can see we have quite a large area potentially snow covered through the winter. And we have a lot of our big catchments, including the Waitaki, uh, the Klutha, Mata'o, the Waio, where there are um, big demands on water resources for things like power generation, also irrigation. Um, so there's a need to understand snow melt and the runoff that's generated from that. And we have a few weather stations um, scattered throughout the Southern Alps at, at high elevations that give us some insight into this. Uh, most of these are run by NEWA, but they kind of represent point samples um, in, a, in a big environment where things vary um, quite substantially in time and space. So they give us some insight into what is happening, but they're just a small snapshot. And so by mapping snow cover and now snow depth across larger areas of the Southern Alps, we can get a much better handle on on what our seasonal snow resource looks like. And the real objective there is to then improve how we're, we're modeling our, our fresh water uh, within the South Island. So in terms of what we see when we think about these um, mapping snow from space, I'll talk a little bit briefly about snow cover. Some of the people in the audience might have seen a bit of this before. We've been doing snow cover mapping primarily with a sensor called MODIS uh, for New Zealand for a while now. So there's a history of work um, really originated with a lot of the work that um, Pascal Sergei did early on, developing methods to actually turn satellite images into snow cover maps. And the really cool thing with MODIS imagery is we get maps of snow cover um, every day of the year, um, going back to the year 2000. So now we have quite a long record. And more recently, we've used that to look at what we can think of as sort of snow climates or snow climatologies in the Klutha Mata'o catchment. And then John O'Conway and others have used this data to really help um, assess uh, snow cover models for New Zealand. So the wee animation there is showing uh, the, anom the anomaly in snow cover duration. So how much shorter or longer than normal is the snow cover duration where we have snow on the ground throughout the course of the year over the um, period going back to the year 2000. So we've got 22 years of data from this snow cover record now. And one of the key things we see is that it's, it's really variable in time and space. So if we wanted to use this data to understand what's happening um, and to improve our models, we need to think about how we can sort of interrogate um, this record, which initially is a, is a pretty dense record of, or a pretty dense data set. Um, so just to give you some, a quick look at some of the things we can do with this, and there's always questions around how snow might be, might be changing. Um, now that we have 22 years worth of data um, from MODIS, we can look at things like snow covered extent, which is the, the average snow cover throughout the month. Um, so here we're looking at a map of snow cover extent for the month of July, um, going from the year 2000 through to 2021. And so we look at these snow covered extent uh, metrics, we can start to see the sort of variability and change that we're dealing with. Um, and this is a, a, a metric that's used pretty widely globally for looking at changes in snow cover um, and mountainous and high latitude um, regions. And one of the key things in New Zealand is that historically, there hasn't been a clear signal. Um, we have a lot of variability in seasonal snow cover, but we haven't really seen long-term trends. And this is still the case through the middle part of winter. So here we've got July and August, um, but we're starting to see moving into, if I skip ahead to say October, so snow covered extent for the month of October from the year 2000 through to 2021, there's an indication now that we might be seeing um, some negative trends emerging and that continues through November and into December. So if we're seeing a reduction in seasonal snow cover, it seems to be occurring um, sort of from the tail end of the season. So um, melt happening perhaps more rapidly um, during the spring. That gives us an idea of, of what is happening, um, but we also have these complex um, spatial patterns. So we have a lot of variability from year to year in terms of where the snow is and how long it lasts on the ground. And when you're looking at a long time series of snow cover, it can be tricky to, to kind of distill that down into something simple. Um, so I've got a few maps on this slide here. They're reasonably, reasonably complex, but I won't dwell on them too long. I just want to point out that when we look at that time series, we see 
patterns that appear from year to year. And some of these patterns are associated more strongly with, with some years than others. So these are um, spatialized principal components. And they give us an idea of kind of key modes of spatial variability of, of seasonal snow. And they help, to under, help us to understand how climate variability from year to year um, is impacting on seasonal snow cover. And one of the things we're looking at doing now is also looking at how um, models can reproduce these same patterns. And that's a, a different way that we can use um, remotely sensed data to assess how well our snow cover models are performing. Um, so historically, we've been looking at snow cover as a key metric to understand seasonal snow in New Zealand. And we're, we're building on that all the time and using it both to understand um, what is happening and also to help improve the models that we work with. But if anyone spends time in snow, you'll know that snow is a three-dimensional medium. It has depth to it. So we need to move on to a slightly more sophisticated tool now, which is something called satellite photogrammetric mapping, or SPM for short, which involves making 3D um, surfaces of the Earth's surface, so three-dimensional maps using overlapping satellite images. And the key idea here is we get images or sets of overlapping images from different, at different points in time. So perhaps in May, early in the winter, and this is from 2012, and then September, late September, when we have a, a maximum snowpack, and we create 3D surface of, surfaces at both of those points in time. And if we subtract one from the other, um, we get a, a difference map. Um, and the difference is snow depth. So we can map snow depth across large areas, which we haven't been able to do before, at a high resolution. And this is kind of a key component of our current project. So we can start to map snow in, in four dimensions, effectively, snow depth um, through time. So for this Deep South project, we've got a, a time series of these images um, throughout the winter of 2012. And they span the early and peak accumulation season, so when our snowpack is building, and also the ablation season when our snowpack is melting. And it's a big data set. So we've got about nearly 5,000 square kilometers of imagery in total. Um, processing that is a big job. And a lot of this is leveraging developments that have been made in the Matariki project, which is led by Pascal Sergei, which is really trying to, here at Otago, which is really trying to automate uh, this three-dimensional mapping um, from satellite imagery. So images coming from satellites in space. So it's a really neat application of this technology to try and better understand a phenomenon or an environmental process that historically has been difficult to measure. So to have a look at what that, what that looks like, mapping snow depth from space, we've got, this is a satellite image um, from early winter when we have very little snow on the ground and another satellite image captured uh, later in the spring when we have sort of a peak snowpack. And the idea is we get three dimensional surfaces for each of those dates and we take the difference and that produces this map here, a change in surface height, which we can infer as a, a map of snow depth across the catchment. And what we're, we're looking at the Jolly catchment here, this region here, which is um, about 30 square kilometers, just east of Araki, um, Mount Cook National Park, or in the eastern part of the, the National Park. And this is a wee test area um, where we're sort of really developing the technique. And we're interested in these spatial patterns. And these are the patterns we want to be able to recreate in our models. So this map of snow depth is at two meter uh, resolution. And there's a lot of detail here, a lot to distill. Um, and we're using this to try and better understand what's happening and to try and improve what's happening within TopNet. One of the key things with our, um, the models we use for looking at seasonal snow is that they don't work in this sort of gridded high resolution um, way. They're, there's something called a semi-distributed model, which means we have individual catchments and we break those catchments up into elevation bands, 100 meter elevation bands. So we need to think of snow depth across a range of elevations to be able to compare back with um, our top net output. And this is our, this is our snow depth distribution um, from our satellite map um, for end of September, or late September 2012. And the key thing here is that we have a, a large range of snow depth through the catchment, but our maximum depths occur at our middle elevations. And that's got some important implications for the way that we think about setting up our models. What we're really interested in here too is turning our snow depth into snow water equivalent. So knowing the volume of snow, uh, sorry, the volume of water that will flow into our rivers when that snow melts. And so we need to apply a density to that snow depth to convert it into snow water equivalent. And this is challenging to do, understanding what, what density to use. Uh, John O'Conway at NEWA has done a lot of work using data from some of the NEWA sites um, to provide us with the, this density function or this curve that allows us to convert depths into snow water equivalent or SWE. And this is, these are really the numbers we're interested in to know, A, how much water is in the catchment um, empirically from our satellite observations, and then B, to give us a metric we can compare with the model output. Um, and so we can characterize, characterize those volumes, compare that with our model output. Um, a key thing here is that the way that we infer our density matters. So depending on the density approach and our new approach that Jono has supported us with, 
is probably the way to go, but it um, results in a much greater density than some of the simpler approaches we might have taken to in estimating the evolution of snow density through the winter. So basically, as the winter progresses, our snow gets denser, and that impacts how much water will be produced by the snowpack when it melts. So when we're thinking about the snow water equivalent, we can think about where it's stored within the catchment as a function of the catchment elevation. So here we're looking at um, the snow water equivalent volume as a percentage of the total within the catchment across elevation bands. And this is within our, our wee jolly catchment here, the upper part of the catchment. And we can see that most of the water is stored at these middle elevations. And that's a combination of the, that being where our maximum snow depths are and also the, the geography of the basin. So most of our terrain is at these elevations. If we compare that with the model outputs, so we've got a scatter plot here showing our Pleiades, that's the satellite imagery, our Pleiades derived snow and our top net snow. And we compare those to one another using a density of 460 roughly kilograms per cubic meter. Um, what we find here is that top net is actually underestimating the total snow volume relative to um, what we've observed with these satellite observations. Um, so that's interesting for us. That's telling us that the model is maybe not putting enough snow into the catchment. There's a few quirky things going on here. We have some very small catchments at this scale that are dominated by avalanche accumulation, and that is not reflected in the model currently at all. Um, and so that's a process um, that we still need to work further to, to resolve. A key question for us is whether top net as a model is putting the snow in the right place within the catchment. So we can look at this elevation distribution. This is our, the blue curve comes from our satellite observations, and we can compare that with what top net um, provides. And actually they, they line up remarkably well um, in terms of that snow volume per elevation band. The key thing is that top net has a wee bit more snow um, in these upper sort of middle reaches, whereas from our satellite observations, we know we get this sort of shift of some of that snow volume down to lower elevations. And that's a product of avalanching um, during the winter and spring, shifting snow from higher to lower elevations. So being able to resolve this process is quite neat in terms of how we can then try and improve our models. This is for a single catchment on a single date, um, close to peak accumulation. So there's a big caveat there. These are sort of preliminary results and we're still processing a big data set, but it's really neat that we can resolve these signals. Um, so we have some other questions around how our snow varies both in space, but also in time. So if we go a little bit later into our melt season, so here we're looking at late September. If we progress to early October, we can see that that elevation distribution of snow depth doesn't vary too much. In fact, in this case, there's a slight increase at higher elevations and a slight decrease at lower elevations. So we're still close to peak accumulation. And we can compare that snow volume per elevation band again, and we see when we get into October, we have a slight increase in snow at lower, slightly lower elevations compared to those higher elevations. And that's possibly reflecting that we still have these big avalanche deposits persisting and thinner snowpack melting at higher elevations here. So we're really interested in these questions around how these satellite observations can help us understand these processes to then try and improve how those processes are represented within the models. And just to wrap up, um, we talk a lot, and some people might have heard me talk about snow um, in the past, and variability is a word I use probably more often than, um, than, than I should. Um, but snow is really variable in space, and TopNet currently characterizes the spatial variability of snow using something called a, a CV or a coefficient of variation. The key thing to know here is that um, that coefficient of variation is used in a uniform way across catchments and through time. Um, but we can see if we compare um, our satellite observations of CV with some older field measurements um, from 2007, um, that the satellite CV observations are a little bit higher, but we do have variability um, as a function of elevation too. So it's maybe it's telling us that maybe we need to think about how we're representing that spatial variability within the models to make sure we are modeling the snow in the right places and therefore expecting it to melt from the right locations. Um, so just to wrap up, it is a really a high level tour of sort of what we're working on for this project, but hopefully giving people some insight into um, the benefits that we're getting from this um, satellite imagery, and especially now that we can map snow depth from space. Um, there's still a bit of work ahead of us with this project. Um, we've done a lot of work developing sort of pipelines to be able to bring the satellite imagery in, process that, and turn it into an output that we can compare with the model data easily. Um, there's a wee bit of work to do around uncertainties and also thinking about um, densities and how we work with that. But really the next step is to scale this up across the, a larger area within the Central Southern Alps and across the full winter time series of 2012 so that we can really see how these patterns evolve 
through the winter um, to help us um, improve what we're doing within our models. So that's all from me. Um, thanks for listening. And yeah, happy to hear any questions at the end of the um, session. Kia ora, Todd. Thank you very, very much. Um, we're going to move fairly quickly to Jen. Just to let everybody know, um, we will have shorter time for questions at the end of our webinar and do keep um, putting them into the Q&A chat panel rather than typing them into the chat function. Um, so I'd love to introduce Jen Purdy now. Jen has spent most of her career in the electricity sector, for example, modelling climate change with Meridian Energy for um, about 14 years. Her Deep South Challenges research is looking at the future of wind, water and electricity supply and demand up to 50 years out from today. So we've we've begun with the source and now we're, we went to the to the top of the, the Maunga and now we're heading down to what happens um, with the water itself. So Nga Mihi Jen, don't forget to unmute yourself and share your screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, thanks, Alex. Um, kia ora koutou, uh, ko Jen Purdy tokou ingoa. Um, nā mihi tu, Ricky and Todd for those really interesting talks and I'll um, take it from there. Now let me just get my screen sharing, which won't take a minute. Uh, that's it. Uh, is that right, Alex? Can you see that? Yep, perfect. Okay. I just can't see my preview. Hang on, sorry. It worked when I did it before. I'll just share. Just while you're looking after that, Jen, just to let everybody know that if we do run over time, then um, we might be able to stay on for another five or so minutes, depending on whether our guests are available. Um, we did do some trial runs, but Zoom and PowerPoint tend not to speak to each other very well. So, All right. Can you see that, Alex? Not yet, unfortunately. <laughs> But just begin anyway, Jen, and if you'd like to, in the background, send me your slides, then I can um, present them while you're speaking. Or just Sorry. wing it. <laughs> <laughs> Worked perfectly when we did it before. Uh, mm -hmm. It's going. Okay. Sorry, I'll try one more time. Yep, I think we've got there. Brilliant. Yep. Yep. Uh, all right, so can you see that? Yes, we can. Good, great. Okay, so um, I am working at the Deep South Science Challenge uh, on a three-year grant, exploring the impact of climate change on the New Zealand electricity system. Um, my work is all looking into the future. So Ricky's talking about how we manage things in the past and now and in the future. And Todd's looked at how we can assess how much snow is up there. Uh, and my work looks 30 years into the future. Um, so today I'm going to start talking to you about electricity, but I'm going to really quickly move to talking to you about rivers and lakes. Uh, are you still there? I seem to have lost you. What am I doing? Okay. So um, I've only got 10 minutes. I'm going to give a really quick overview of my research in its entirety and then focus in on the changes that we're expecting to see in our rivers in the future. So my research looks at projected changes to wind, water, electricity demand and supply, and our ability to keep the lights on out to 2050 by bringing all those aspects together. I'd like to acknowledge Christian Zamet and Richard Turner from NEWA providing me with uh, water and wind projections respectively and collaborating with me on this project. 
And I use an electricity system model called LPCON, which I have um, borrowed from Meridian Energy and would like to acknowledge their support, and in particular Grant Telfer, who made the model that I use. Uh, I'm not going to, into, to go into the modeling at all here, but um, this is a quick schematic of the model. Uh, and just to say that it, at its finest resolution, it can show all the demand and generation and power flows in between 166 grid exit points on a subweekly scale up to 2050. So it's quite um, high resolution. Um, here is one pathway uh, at, for the electricity system in New Zealand out to 2050. I'm just jumping to some electricity system results just to give you a flavor of some of the outputs of the modeling, and then I'll go back to rivers. This is a mid range emissions scenario with relatively ambitious decarbonization policy framework. It shows the electricity system generation for each year out to 2050 and how it will be generated. The black dotted line is percent renewable. Um, and so you can see that uh, for a start that electricity demand is going projected, is projected to increase by about 50% by 2050. So big increase in electricity demand and that is largely from the electrification of transport and industrial heat. Um, and you can also see the part that hydro plays, that's a dark blue, and 55% of our current electricity is generated from hydro. Um, uh, and that's going to stay fairly steady because people don't want to, people don't have the appetite for flooding large valleys anymore, which I think is a good thing. Um, but its, it's contribution goes way beyond that, and that it is going to be after the coal and gas closed down, that's the black wedges there, um, in about the mid-2030s, it's going to be the, the big battery bank that gives us the ability to firm up all the intermittency of all the other renewables, uh, including light green as wind and yellow as solar, you can see that they are going to grow exponentially, and when the wind stops blowing and the sun stops shining, then we're going to use the hydro to firm up and to uh, fill the gap, if you like. So the main focus of my research is looking at how wind, water and demand intersect. But today I'm going to focus on the water and how it's changing. I'm going to show you both the projections from NIWA about how the flows in our rivers are going to change over time. And then how the changes to the electricity system might change those river flows and lake levels in hydro catchments downstream. So just as a big overview to start with, we're expecting reasonably significant changes to river flows due to projected changes in rainfall and snow. This um, picture is from that paper there, Collins, Montgomery and Zamet in 2018, and it gives a good overview of a whole bunch of New Zealand rivers and what direction they're heading in. This data comes from Topnet, um, from Christian Zamet, and it's effectively the same data that I am um, using further down the track here in this presentation. So the big thing to note is that uh, the North Island rivers and the red box are generally going to get drier in the next few decades, and the South Island rivers generally are going to get wetter in the next few decades. Um, and that 80% of New Zealand's hydroelectricity inflows are in the South Island. In particular, I draw your attention to the annual inflows, which, as I said, drier in the North, wetter in the South. Um, which as some could say is a, is a good news story for hydroelectricity in New Zealand, given that most of our big hydro machines are in the South Island. Um, but of course, the devil's in the detail about timing and where it arrives and when it arrives. Uh, and I'd also draw your attention to this um, statistic, which is the mean annual flood. Uh, um, there's not much information on that for the North Island. The jury's still a bit out, but the South Island, it would appear that our floods are going to get bigger. And that sort of fits in with research around the world that, that agrees with that. So to look at that in more detail, that's that sort of overall annual changes. If we look at seasonal changes, um, the biggest change is going to be in the seasonality, and that's especially in the snow-fed South Island catchments. Um, I'm going to focus in at the, now from here on on the biggest hydro catchment in the North Island, the Waikato, and the biggest hydro storage catchment in the South Island, the Waitaki, um, where Lake Pukaki is our biggest hydro storage lake. So I'll just look at those two from now on to give some idea of, of what the changes are going to be. Um, in the North Island, the Waikato, the summer river flows are going to are, are expected to get drier and winter inflows stay the same or wetter over time. Uh, this is looking ahead to 2050, this graph. And the coloured lines are different RCPs or representation concentration pathways, with the red line being a high emission scenario and the blue line a low emission scenario and the other two in between. And generally, the rule is that the higher the emissions, the more impact there will be on our rivers. 
Um, it, it would seem from uh, the the um, implementation of the Paris Agreement that RCP 8.5 is becoming less likely, but um, the world is an uncertain place. It's good to explore all possibilities. So um, if we go ahead and look at uh, Lake Kōkaki at the head of the Waitaki catchment in the South Island, the changes are much bigger. Um, that is, it's the biggest snow fed catchment. Uh, and it's it's got it's one of the areas that Todd was talking about. Uh, and we're expecting significantly higher river flows in winter in the future, and the summer to remain the same or uh, get drier. Um, and this much better matches electricity demand. At the moment or in past history, all the water arrives in these big South Island lakes in the summer because that's when it rains the most and when the snow is melting. Uh, and all the electricity demand, or most of it, is in the winter. Um, when there is no inflows. So we need the storage to transfer that water from one season to another. So in the future, that's going to get better. It's going to match better. Um, if we look at the um, the data behind this, the, these graphs uh, and just focus in here on annual changes, generally uh, annual changes uh, in the North Island going to get um, slightly drier and in the South Island, slightly wetter. So uh, Lake Kōkaki under a high emission scenario by 2050 might be 9% wetter uh, annually and uh, Waikato 4% drier annually. Um, and then winters are expected to get wetter in both catchments, um, mainly from rainfall increases uh, in the North Island, but mainly from snowmelt increases in the South Island. Um, so uh, that's the big seasonal changes and, and annual changes. But if we look now um, at volatility, like I said before, we're expecting floods to get bigger, particularly in the South Island. Um, so this is a graph of um, Lake Pukaki inflow changes uh, daily uh, time series of projections for 100 years, looking out to 2100 for Lake Pukaki. And the first thing um, that you would note Sorry. Um, the first thing you'd note is that floods do appear to be getting bigger there. Um, now, this is because, mainly because a warmer atmosphere can hold more water. So ostensibly about 8% more water for every degree of warming. And remember, we've already warmed a degree in the last century. Um, and that's going to make flood peaks bigger. So this has implications for the safety of people and damage to infrastructure. Uh, and in the hydro catchments, it has implications for whether the extra water in a flood can be captured by the storage lakes to lower potentially damaging flood peaks downstream, and whether it will be spilt past structures and not generated with, or whether we can capture it. Um, if you look at the trends in that in that uh, graph there, um, you can see that the um, floods are indeed looking to get quite a lot bigger, and the dry periods are expected to get drier over time. In fact, under a high emission scenario, we might expect to be um, twenty percent wetter, uh, more larger floods um, by 2100. And if you just look at the period of the electricity modeling that I'm doing, we might expect to get 8% bigger flood peaks by 2050. So that's quite a significant change um, that will have to be uh, dealt with and, and that river users will have to be aware of. So that's the South Island, that's Lake Pukaki flood changes. Let's have a quick look at the Waikato. Uh, for the North Island. So um, the, the jury is still a little bit out on the, the whether the flood peaks are going to increase as much in the in the North Island, um, but the dries do seem to be projected to get a bit um, lower, so drier. So this so far what I've talked about is um, Niwa's modelling of how inflows are going to change in the future. Um, and But now I'm going to put that through the electricity system model, which is also undergoing huge changes with changes to renewables and increasing intermittency of um, supply and see how that is going to modify the river flows downstream. Um, so the Waitaki River below Lake Pukaki has eight power stations down its length and the Waikato River has eight as well. So just the mere existence of these um, power schemes is going to uh, alter the, the sort of regime of river flows all the way down the river. So these flow changes were put into the model and with changes to electricity system factors. And I'm just going to show you impacts on two factors downstream, and that is hydro lake storage levels in future and spill in future. So if we start by looking at hydro lake inflow, uh, sorry, hydro storage lake levels or, or storage quantity, um, this graph shows us 2020 to 2050 uh, for Lake Pukaki 
uh, and its weekly hydro storage. Um, and you can see the, the black line there is average storage, and you can see that it goes up, uh, storage goes up in summer when the inflows are coming in and there's not much electricity demand, and then hydro storage goes down in winter when we need the electricity, we generate the, um, the electricity, and there's not much inflows because of snow um, tying up the water up in the headwaters. Um, but you can also see that, that there's changes over time. Um, so overall, the lakes are going to spend more time at full and less time at empty. And that's because once we become 100% renewable, there's a greater need for the hydro to be there ready to balance the intermittency of renewables. So there's no big coal plant we can turn on when it's dry or the wind stops blowing in the future. The model is penalised for running out. It's, a, it's an economic model in many ways. Um, and things get very expensive and lights go out when we run out of hydro and there's no wind and, and sun. Um, and so, therefore, the, the model is trying to keep the lakes higher to be ready to balance out that intermittency. Also, the difference between the highest storage level and the lowest storage level each year, the range, you'll be able to see there on that black line is narrowing. Uh, and that's because of the big shift of inflows from summer to winter, uh, which better matches demand. So the hydro storage doesn't go quite so high and low uh, as it might have in the future, in, in the past, sorry. Um, and this is just another way of looking at, at this. If we look at the four main big hydro uh, schemes in the South Island, um, the top graph is the percent of time that the lakes are empty from 2020s to 2050s, and it's all um, there, they spend a lot less time empty. And then the bottom graph is the percent of time full. And so um, the model says that the, the lakes are going to spend a lot more time full in future. So if we move now to look at spill, how's spill going to change? And spill is the, the, the sending of the water through the spill gates um, uh, down the river and not generating with it because you have too much and you can't contain it in the storage lakes. Um, this graph tells us once again 2020 to 2050 that we will expect spill to increase over time. It generally increases as the coal and gas plant retires and by the mid 2030s we're 100% renewable and it stays fairly static after that. If we just look at the first year of this graph and the last year and just focus in on those a little bit, um, we can see that in 2020 the top graph uh, that's sorry, that's June to June on the x axis. So it's got summer in the middle and winter at the edges. Uh, same with the bottom graph. So the top graph's 2020 and the bottom graph's 2050 out of the model, um, showing how much spill there is. So in the 2020 graph at the top, there's much less spill uh, with a peak there of 350 gigawatt hours of spill uh, in any given week, compared to in 2050, the peak spill for the year is 600 gigawatt hours. But also you can see that in 2020 it only occurs, spill only occurs from November to May. So that's when the snow is melting, we've got higher rainfall, not much electricity demand, the lakes are high, and there's also a higher chance of flood over that, that time. Whereas in 2050, uh, spill can occur almost any time of the year. Um, so if we move on now, just a quick summary of that, uh, those graphs, we can expect that um, spill as a percent of generation doubles um, by 2050 um, and that the um, spill will increase by about 600 gigawatt hours so that's quite significant um, but this is offset somewhat by the increase in annual inflows of 430 gigawatt hours in these collective catchments by this time uh, and my initial work shows that future increased storage and spill is caused by both changes to annual inflows changes to electricity demand um, and in volatility in particular, and increased renewables. So just to summarise, we're expecting significant changes to the New Zealand energy system over coming decades, both on the supply side with changes to hydro lake inflows and wind patterns, and on the demand side with the electrification of transport and industry, increased irrigation load uh, down the east coast with increased droughts, uh, changing uh, reductions to cooling load and uh, sorry, increases to cooling load and decreased heating load. The changes to rivers will not come not only from the changes to climate, which will influence rainfall and river flows in the headwaters, but also changes to the way, that, and to snowmelt of course, but also changes to the way that the rivers are used downstream by hydropower managers and potentially other river users such as irrigation. Significant changes to the seasonality of river flows are expected in coming decades, particularly in snow fed catchments, with river flows being higher in winter than currently. 
and we're expecting them to become more volatile, particularly in the South Island with flood peaks increasing and dry periods getting drier. And hydro lakes in the South Island are expected to spend more time at higher levels and spills predicted to double by 2050. And the modeling that I've shown you here, the results of that um, the storage and spill is from a mid-range emissions scenario, but um, I'm currently modeling low and high emissions scenarios to look at the impacts of those. Cool, thank you. This, by the way, is uh, Clutha Dam, uh, Clyde Dam, November 99, um, 4,300 cumics going down the spillway. Um, and the spillway is designed for 4,700 cumics, so quite significant. The access bridge had already been washed out. And those two little black dots are people watching that big wave, which I don't think I'd be doing. <laughs> thank you very much, Jen. And thank you for, um, you know, keeping your presentation to time as well. We actually are at one o'clock, um, but I think we, we hopefully have time for at least one question before too many, um, too many of our participants leave the webinar. So um, there's some some questions have been answered by our um, facility by our presenters typing answers, but there's one question here that I think probably goes to the heart of why these three presentations have been placed together in the one webinar. It's a question from Murray Doak for uh, Ricky, which I can see you're typing an answer to as well. But the question is, you know, Perhaps there's general agreement that the holistic um, ideals of te mana o te wai or the holistic goals of te mana, te mana o te wai be achieved, but um, what are we missing in our tools um, in order to achieve, in order to realise those goals? Okay, Akwe Ricky, and you're on mute. Yeah, that's, um, not sure there's any short answer there. I think for me, a lot of it comes down to implementation and the nature of consent. So consent is a standard almost absolute, right? So for the duration of the consent, it's very hard to change it. So even if we, even if we change the limits, so if we say we, we're taking too much water out of this water body, we're going to set a lower limit for takes. Less water can be taken. Um, existing consents can will continue taking the amount they have consented already for the duration of that consent. That could be up to 35 years. So there's it's a, it's a huge lag in the system to be able to adjust things in real time. And we can't do that, and that has a huge impact because we've made decisions, you know, in Otago, now some of the consents in Otago and the money I talked to and others are mining permits from the 1800s, right? Almost absolute rights, they were sunset clause in the RMA, 35 years, you'll have to transition to a consent. We're going through that now. There's a real unwillingness to not renew or not reallocate existing allocations to use. I think that's a challenge. And I don't think we set limits as absolute limits. We set them as more of a guideline as this is what we'd like to see and then largely continue to allocate beyond those limits anyway in lots of places. Mm. Uh, so until we actually start making some of those tough calls about this is how much water is available and we're going to allocate only that amount, whether that's takes or discharges, um, then we need to move to a more, in my view, it's a proportional sort of not necessarily the QMS and fisheries, but a QMS type system where your allocation is, is relative to the amount of water that's available. So you get allocated 5%. If the limit decreases 5%, your allocation decreases 5% along with that. And that, that can happen in real time. It gives us much flex more flexibility to be able to adjust our management of these things because we don't know how much is going to rain. We don't know what's going to be there any single day. I think we're a little bit black and white. And I think, so having spent nearly seven years, I think, on the Land and Water Forum, there was a real appetite to change things, but also a determination to maintain what people already had. We, we all see the need for changing the system, as long as it doesn't affect our existing our existing rights to, well, they're not property rights, but rights to take things or to, to take, you know, and I, I don't, I'm not going to single anyone out, but some of those big users were very much in that space that, um, even, you know, we're nationally important in terms of power generation. Everybody needs power. That needs to be maintained. Take it from somewhere else. Or take, you know, farmers saying, well, if you take away our irrigation consents or our discharge consents, then our farming, op our farming operations are no longer viable. I don't know what the answer to where you take it from is, and that's not for me to determine. That, that, but we as a community have to start having some of those hard conversations that the amount of water we're taking or the amount of you know, 
discharges we're putting back into our water bodies is just not sustainable. So we've got to adjust it. How do we adjust it? That's a transition, but designing a new system is relatively straightforward. You could have a you could have a better system. You could have a you know a, a, a proportional sort of allocation model. But to get from where we are now with the current set of rights and, and inverted commas because they're not property rights, although people treat them like that. The set of rights into a new system is really difficult. And it's a, it's a long-term transition to, to do that equitably, I think. Yeah. Uh, the other factor is my Tangana Whenua are locked, largely locked out of the system. There's been no recognition of our right to share in the water economy, for want of a better word, but water allocation of what it takes and discharges and to provide that headspace in a system which is already fully allocated in most places, or at least lots are over-allocated already, to give effect to one or two, you've got, to, you've got to take some water off some people who have already got it and put it back into the system. That's going to cause some pain because no one wants to give up their existing rights, as I said. Uh, and to recognise iwi rights and interest, you've got to take some more to, to allow an allocation to iwi. And you've also probably got to allow an allocation to people who haven't got water now because the existing system is okay. inequitable, unfair in all sorts of ways. So... Sorry, well, that's really, <laughs> I think you know. It, it I is, mean, I, it's a yeah. reallocation, a re rebalancing of equity and long equitable. Yeah, and I think I think your response kind of goes to the heart of the challenges of climate adaptation in general, in that many many of the decisions facing us will require fundamental rethink rather than just very minor or incremental changes here and there. I we're at 10 past one, so we are going to conclude here. Um, thank you so much to our presenters. If if guests out there have questions for, for our presenters, you can just email those questions to me or someone else at the challenge, and um, we'll ask our presenters if they're able to answer them in their own time, and we'll circulate those responses a little bit down the track. Um, but to finish, I'll finish with Karakia and, um, and see you all very soon. Te mauri o te hui ka ea, te mauri o te wānanga ka ea, koa ki runga, koa ki raro, haumie huie paikie. Ngā mihi koutou. Thanks, Alex.